Thank you, Jessica. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you again for joining this series of cybersecurity webinar partnered with Cisco Systems. So in the past two weeks, um, we've covered currently, uh, the current threat landscape with Cisco Talos, a threat research organization with Cisco System. And last week, we did cover Zero Trust Framework for Remote Workforces. For those who missed these sessions, we have provided the links in the WebEx chat window as you can further review it after this event. So our last webinar will cover that Zero Trust Framework and the importance of securing remote workforces. And today, this session, we will cover what is the Zero Trust Framework for workplace and why it is important. Again, we have, we're lucky to have Aaron Torres, cybersecurity architect from Cisco System, to discuss what is Zero Trust Framework for workplace. Aaron? Hello, how's everybody doing? Uh, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, Paul, just to make sure that uh, my screen is sharing just fine. Um, anybody? <laughs> Daniel, Paul? Yeah, you're good. Okay, good. Yep. Okay. You're good. Yep, you're good. Okay. Uh, guys, uh, thank you for having me again. Uh, my name is uh, Aaron Torres. Uh, I'm a cybersecurity architect, uh, also known as the janitor, father, husband, <laughs> whatever else you want to call me. Um, and uh, I've been with Cisco roughly about six years. And, and, and you know, I, I actually really enjoy working for Cisco. And one of the main reasons why um, is primarily for the reason because they they have really allowed me to understand that security really is more than just one product. Uh, it really is more than just a firewall, right? They've really opened my mind and allowed me to evangelize the the models that we use here at Cisco from a security perspective that, you know, it, it could be multiple areas. It could be inside a network, it could be an endpoint, it could be a device, and et cetera. So I've, I'm have i really grateful for my time here at Cisco, and, and I look forward to a, a much longer time at Cisco. <laughs> and, and I hope everybody uh, is being safe with the pandemic, and, and if anyone's joining from Mexico or anywhere, I'm really uh, sorry to hear about the uh, the earthquakes and I, if you have any family there I, I do my prayers are with you and I hope everybody's fine so um, with that being said um, you know if you've attended some of our webinars uh, this past week you, you've kind of maybe heard me talk about zero trust and what zero trust is and and kind of where uh, what how I see it right or maybe how Cisco sees it from from that perspective the kind of what I want to mention here is I'm gonna do my very best to kind of keep this uh, vendor neutral. I think it's important to understand the perspective of how the world is looking at zero trust and not just from a Cisco perspective, because if anything, you take anything from this presentation today, I want you to be able to sit back and kind of realize what current investment have I made in my current infrastructure and what can we do to evolve uh, to a more of an evolving perimeter, involving uh, infrastructure involving public cloud, hybrid cloud, whatever it might be, to to add that zero trust model or framework into your environment, right? And if you have attended some of our past uh, presentations, I, I do apologize. Some of this uh, very beginning might be a little redundant, uh, but for the people that have not attended um, this webinar and have not had any exposure to what zero trust is, I, I am going to kind of go over that, and hopefully uh, that helps you understand kind of what our perspective of zero trust is. Um, you know, everywhere we look in today's market, there are things changing. It could be from, you know, with the pandemic, you know, people working remotely, right? Uh, if you remember many years ago, the big, the big craze was BYOD, right? How are we going to control these mobile devices? And, and this last year, what was really big was IoT devices uh, and hand scanners, phones, uh, Internet of Things, how... How are we going to go about protecting a lot of these things? And that was really top of mind for a lot of people, right? You know, and, and now that the devices are growing, vendors are pushing out business cases of why you need these devices, either being for a business reason or for productivity. And then what are we doing to host those applications? Uh, many, many years ago, you, you, your thought process, you need a local server, right? And that local server to host an application, to be able to relay that, that stream of applications to those local devices. Nowadays, 
bandwidth is so widely available that we can use cloud applications, we can use hybrid infrastructures, we can use public cloud. And what type of challenges do those things bring today? And a lot of those challenges are is a security mess, in lack of better words. Um, you know, and, and what I mean by that is when I sit down and I think about I got all these handhelds, I have all these devices, how do I keep them up to date? How do I know that they're trusted or not trusted? How do I know um, the people using them are really using them? And if I, you know, if you listen to me last week, I talked about industrial control. And a lot of times industrial control areas, you have these kiosks that you go, you know, that in, in a class one div two area that you go and log into, and then you get access to the applications or the gauges or whatever it might be to do your job, right? What, what would happen if that was the wrong person? What would happen if someone's um, faked the social engineering to get to that area and did something to damage it or got remote control, right? And, and in being in the energy industry in, in my past lifetime, something that was very depressing for me is sometimes you use the cable modem in these class one div two areas for internet because it had to be separate from other networks and it and it didn't get the correct firewall it didn't get the correct security measures so anyone could have access to those things with the correct social engineering or the correct um, you know tools for hacking so we have to really think about one key thing and, and that's trust you know and, and I'm going to use a horrible example. I, I was married in a previous lifetime, and, and I trusted that person that I was dating that ended up in the long run knowing that I, I couldn't trust that person because they did many things to hurt my feelings, to uh, lie, cheat, whatever it might be. I lost trust in that person. So you can't always just say, I trust this scenario without having things in the middle to have visibility on what is going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen the next day. And, and do we have things in place like a prenup or a lawyer to help fix these issues in the future? So as we talked about going back to technology and not my personal life <laughs> is what can we do as a framework to develop trust, to build trust, earn trust, and make sure that we're covering different aspects of our environment to protect our environment. As a certified pen tester and as a, a, a retired hacker, there is a methodology that hackers use or security experts or cyber criminals use to attack things. Sometimes these uh, script kitties make it very easy by just scanning things and hopefully hope they get um, lucky and have access to something. But the more advanced people, when they have a targeted attack, take a framework. And that framework goes from information gathering to exploitation to post-exploitation to analysis. Why would we not take that same approach to protecting our environment? And, and that's one thing I've really liked about Zero Trust. Zero Trust has a, a framework from a workforce, workload, workplace perspective of what how, what should we do about user device access or the applications that we're accessing or when we're on those networks what are we doing to build trust and are they accessing the correct things and are we monitoring what they're doing right and and there are many threats uh you know and, and a lot of people think if you watch hacker movies and stuff like that you know a lot of people think things can be done in five seconds you're in and you're compromised you're pwned and all that good stuff you know, that, that's the movies. And in a targeted attack, it takes a framework and it takes a lot of time to analyze what's going on. And, and a true story, not, a friend of mine asked me online and said, hey, Aaron, I, I, I want to, I know you're in the security industry. I need your elite hacker skills. And I go, okay, well, what do you need? He goes, I need you to target an application for me. I need you to hack uh, this Instagram account. Okay, well, Okay, well, let's look into it. And what, what, what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, I think my girlfriend's cheating on me, and I want to validate and read their messages. And, you know, I'm analyzing this going, well, this is illegal, so I really can't do this. But let's analyze this. <laughs> let's figure out uh, what options we have. And so we, we knew the target identity of the person that we wanted to breach, right? And I listed, and we knew the application, and we knew what the device they had. So we had to start analyzing what threat could we do 
for that particular person. And it could it be a phishing attempt? Could it be a man in the middle attack on their network for wireless to intercept what they're doing? Is it a, a file for malware we could send them and have remote access by a, a rat, which is a remote access tool? So we were using a framework to be able to identify our, our, and how are we going to do that, right? Needless to say, after all the questions I, I had for this particular person, he goes, you know what, never mind. He goes, I, I didn't realize it, 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 there was so much we had to do. And I was like, yeah, it, it's, not, it's not the movies, right? <laughs> so by using that, there's a lot of things that people will do to get that information, it being personal, uh, financial gain, um, being uh, the, that un unfortunately skip, uh, script kitty found a device that had access to a, a secret network or top secret network, military, healthcare, whatever it might be. So it's important that we use every case that we have to prevent risk, right? And then second, do we, if they were to gain access, what visibility do we have to identify those risks? And if they were to compromise something, what are we doing to contain those breaches and contain those problems within that environment? And that's really where I enjoy the zero trust approach because the zero trust approach allows me to build a framework as an administrator, as an engineer, to determine what areas of protection I put in an environment. So, you know, today we're talking about workplace, so I'll kind of go over everything in general, but like workforce being the people that are getting access to perimeter, right? Protecting the actual application. So for example, if I need access to Office 365 or VPN or a particular network, that's the workforce, the remote workforce. And we talked about that last week on securing devices and those applications. Workload being, are we securing those connections and what are they doing? Do we have visibility? Are we trying to create security posture based on workflows? But today we're going over workplace. And what are we doing if they're inside of our network? Do they have the correct connections? Are they accessing the correct people? Are those devices trusted or not? And what are they doing to redeem themselves or mitigate or remediate those particular devices? Trust is something you have to earn. And, and it's something up front where we say, you are not trusted. I don't believe in you, nothing against you, nothing personal. I don't believe your intentions with me are truthful. I don't care if you work for my company or not, but you must establish trust based off user identity, uh, your device, the vulnerabilities, um, you know, those applications you need access to. Are you, you know, do you have malware? Do you, is there any indication of compromises that you have in particular that I need to know about before you come in? Okay, I give you access. Now that you have access to my network, I need to know what you need access to. I need to know, are you authenticated? What network resources you have? Um, you know, what your workloads are, how you communicate, and do I have visibility in what you're doing, and continuously making sure that that trust is there, and if you violate my trust, what am I going to do to contain you and to remediate you and put you somewhere, in, like I do with my daughter, I put her in the corner of time out and say, hey, I don't trust that you can clean your room anymore because you did a very poor job, but let me teach you on how to correct yourself and get out of timeout so that way we can fix this and everybody can be happy again. These are things uh, that Cisco believes that, uh, and also as an industry, that we have to put in place for zero trust. And, you know, I'll kind of lightly go over some of our products today that kind of fit in those areas, duo for workforce, centration for workload, SD access being DNA center and ICE for workplace. But I'm going to try my best not to focus on those applications as much, but talk more from a, a very general perspective. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the one thing we are going to focus on today is workplace. And workplace being, we need to identify those problems. And, and right now, in, in any speech, if, you, if in case you don't know who I am, I, I attend Black Hat, DEF CON, uh, GTEx in Dubai, all the different major events. If I have an opportunity to speak, you know, I, I do. But if you've heard me speak before, the number one thing I always mention is visibility. Visibility being the number one important thing in any security space. It, it almost kills me to hear people say, I want uh, to create this firewall rule. Based on what? Well, someone called me and help desk needs is done. Great. Um, have you tested it? Have you validated it there? Uh, have you seen this problem before? And that's where visibility 
is so important to the security industry is you need to validate and see what's going on. And, and I always tell people, oh, use a sniffer, uh, you, use NetFlow, use whatever you can to just get a grasp of what's going on in your environment, and you'd be surprised on what you thought you had to protect against versus what you really need to protect yourself against because the things are happening live on your network today. And, and being able to not only prevent unauthorized access, but identify those workflows and build a security posture on that. Now that's a very complex solution. There's different tools, different things you got to do. So we need to look at a centralized model, a centralized way to configure and deploy and develop those things to make it easier for people. But in a zero trust in a workplace environment, number one thing is that we have to identify what are the unauthorized endpoints in your corporate network? Are they devices? Do we know they are what we, they say they are? If it's an iPad, is it really an iPad? Is it a BlackBerry? Is it really a BlackBerry? And should I even allow BlackBerry to my network? So we need to identify what endpoints we have in our network and should we give them access to the network or limited access to the network before they authenticate or do I have a way to quarantine them? You need to ask yourself those things. And from a non-critical asset and being able to give them unrestricted network access, should they? Should they have full-blown access to the infrastructure? Should, is there a difference between macro and micro segmentation, right? And that's kind of where I am really happy working for Cisco because we have other tool sets, other solutions within Cisco that are just not security, but like ACI, for example. Application-centric infrastructure allows me to do like micro segmentation to say, I'm on the same VLAN as you, but I'm in my own little bubble, my own little group, and even though I have unrestricted network access to other devices, even though we're neighbors, I don't trust you. I need to make sure that there's a contract between us that allows us to communicate with each other, and at the same time still being scanned via IPS or AV or whatever tools you need to be able to identify it has the correct access between us, right? And then if, and nothing's a silver bullet, any security vendor that goes out there and tells you, I have the answer to everything, I have 100% efficiency, we're, we're good to go, you don't have to go to anyone else, I, I would question that. There are so many dynamics behind threat feeds and products and bugs and issues, and Cisco's not perfect. But I am happy to know that Cisco does everything they can to be as good as they can for their customers. Our customers really do come first before anything, and we really do everything we can to support our partners, such as Databox, to be successful when implementing, developing, selling, whatever it might be for their customers. And as we see these compromised endpoints affect other assets in these environments, that making sure that we have a way to isolate them and evaluating what infrastructure you currently have in place and can, can we continuously evaluate that trust and make sure that we have the capability of quarantining them? And that's really where the zero trust solution comes in is that we can use a solution, a product to be able to, to do that, establish trust, enforce that trust-based access and do they have access to things and how are we going about that and continually that verify trust. So going to the network visibility, you know, the users, the devices on the network, are they being authenticated? Are they being postured? Are they being profiled? And that's really where the five pillars of zero trust really comes in. We have endpoint visibility, secure access, network segmentation, endpoint compliance, and rapid threat containment. And just to touch a little on each one, endpoint visibility being a, an agent or a not an agent, but it could you know be agentless. It could be the fact that we are looking at agents in the infrastructure and verifying what they're doing and, and being able to validate, are they vulnerable or not? And do they have secure access? Are they being encrypted? And do we have the capabilities in our environment to segment these things and say, if you're bad, we quarantine you, or if you're gaining access into a network and you want to authenticate that that network you have is a, a limited resources network until you, do, until you earn trust on the network. And at the same time, compliance. And are you meeting compliance? As we know, HIPAA, uh, you know, PCI, and, and I hate using those buzzwords, but you can even nowadays develop your own form of compliance in your environment to meet. And, and if you violate that compliance, what are we doing to remediate that? 
But as we all know, everything's not a silver bullet. So it doesn't matter of time when something does get compromised. And when you're battling these hackers, these script kitties, or, or these automated you know, tools out there, that we're remediating them, and we're evaluating them, and we're using third-party products to contain them based on the threats that they have. And when we look at network visibility, not just from a network, but an endpoint perspective too, is that we're looking at these, these, these groups of devices and identifying are, are, what user groups are they part of? What type of device are they? Where are they located? Do we need to develop geofencing, right? Uh, postures and threats and behaviors, and do they have vulnerabilities known to them? And, and are those devices being recorded? Do I have an asset tracker of those devices? And am I determining what access those devices need? For example, if a handheld scanner at an airport out at the baggage claim is being used to record information, there's no reason why that needs internet access. We should have an update server internally to do those things. And by doing that, we can track you know, those MAC addresses associated with IP addresses, so even usernames, integrate the SSO or Active Directory into them and, and then identifying a profile, an observable profile, identified to that endpoint and saying, you are a camera. This is the traffic load that you have. This is the type of a, a behavior I expect from you. And these are the policies and violations that you can obey and disobey by. And I wanna set an action based off that. So when we classify things by groups or specific access needs by function, that we're looking at these devices and saying, if you're in a campus and you're an employer or a contractor, you're allowed to use these devices if they're profiled correctly and they only have access to these environments. That is, sounds complicated, but in today's environments, it's needed. Because if you think about it, a hacker, when they hack something within an environment and they are uh, pivoting through like Netcat or, or something in an environment to gain access to something, just because they compromise that particular device does not mean that's the device they need. They will pivot through that device through other areas on the network. And if it's all a flat network with no role-based access, no, no, no segmentation in any way, they have access to everything, just that one device, which is why it's important that there is that multi-layer of authentication or multi-layer of segmentation and device trust. Because when we look at segmentation, we need to be able to identify if you were to authenticate it in a certain level and you are who you are, and you've done that through multi-factor authentication. You are the device on our product called ICE that identifies that you are the correct uh, device and et cetera. The certificate's valid. Do you have access to that network? And if you do and you don't, what are we doing about that? And is it automated? Meaning, are we waiting for human interaction to, qu to quarantine something? And if so, how long does it take for the rest of the infrastructure to be affected by a compromised device if that person's sleeping? or if we don't have some type of automated way to quarantine things, because as we know, networks and conditions within an environment are changing daily, and the days of someone monitoring something on the screen all day long are, are over. An automated SOC to be able to identify roles and access are, you know, need to be automated. And to build those policies based on segmentation is so important. And you know, it, it, we all in every environment, every network has visitors or human resources or sales or you know, research and development. And, and, and let's say you're here at Cisco, I do a lot of malware testing, and I don't want my home network to be affected by that. So I want to make sure the devices that I have are added to a device list that's trusted. And I also need to make sure that I'm using my current infrastructure to make sure that the data I have in there is not being leaked into my, my kid's you know, wireless network or my, my wife's uh, laptop. And, and in a bigger environment, an ERM, ordering DevOps, you know, retail, whatever it might be, Based on user and device location, we want to manage segmentation based off how you authenticate and how you're accessing things. And it can be as simple as using a matrix to be able to identify contracts or access lists or firewalls or policies to be able to determine how things are accessing that network. And, and you know, a lot of times the expectation is, hey, it's great that we have a group of employees accessing you know different areas like printers and et cetera. And I always get that call of, hey, the printers are on a different VLAN and all of my different VLANs need to have access to that printer. Well, to me, that's a, a security concern. So in reality, they're really, most of the time people only develop half that infrastructure. We would like for it to be where there's groups and there's different um, you know VXLANs or VLANs developed in different areas to determine contracts and how things communicate with each other. But in all reality, customers are not necessarily making the investment in 
the appropriate infrastructure, and if they do, they're not doing it completely, which leaves a gaping hole of security and a lot of unknowns. And we, you know, and we have we partner with partners such as DataVox to help you access and do those assessments and make sure that we're doing everything we they can to make sure that you're fully secure in, in those type of environments. And doing those assessments, which I really like about DataVox, DataVox has this program called the Assessment Service, where they go out and they assess what you have, what you have done, haven't done, and what they recommend. And based off that assessment, will determine the policies they create for segmentation, either it being security group tags or uh, VLANs, VX, VLANs, whatever it might be. And then they build postures on those devices and essentially associate things and say, now that we know that that is a laptop, an Apple laptop, we need to make sure it has the latest patches, that uh, it has the latest antivirus, and it has you know cold disk encryption, uh, that registry's not changing, if it's a Windows laptop, whatever it might be, that when these devices are on the corporate network, it's not just, oh, hey, you're an Apple laptop, we trust you. We need to make sure that they're obeying the rules, even from a software level, and make sure they're getting the latest patches, the latest information on those devices. But even further than that, which is important, is IoT. You know, I think about the pandemic and, and the pandemic on COVID and some of the issues that caused, you know, I was actually even did a presentation this last week on phishing and how in Las Vegas, oddly enough, a, a, a group, an organized crime group, I don't want to call them mafia because they're not really mafias anymore, but they're more of organized criminals, took over by gunpoint very nicely a, a Las Vegas clinic and, and emailed everybody in their list. Uh, that they were giving um, next day results for COVID testing for $199. Uh, please come in, drive up, you know, we'll be wearing our masks, we'll put something in your mouth, put it in the bag, whatever, get an email your results the next day, but you must pay online. And when you go pay online, you know, and all that good stuff. The interesting for me on that was they made over, you know, $4 million uh, in, in a two-week period of left and, and basically gave people fake results. This was on the news and said they were all negative. So this 4,000 or whatever people that went got compromised with malware uh, by going to that and, and lost money and still got infected and thought they were safe. Why I'm bringing this up, because we rely a lot on medical devices. We rely and trust when we go into a doctor's office. We, we have this automated trust that this doctor has the controls to, to protect us because of our health. So it's kind of we bypass these layers of security to gain that trust. And when we look at those things, when when people take over these areas like they did in COVID, that think about the destruction they can cause on you know lighting system, uh, power, um, you know, healthcare monitoring, patient solutions, monitoring solutions, all these things. It's scary the changes and things they can do uh, within these environments, right? It's kind of an inherited trust that we're having. So it's important that that our customers are investing either in managed care service providers or whatever for monitoring and, and having a response and, and monitoring the behavior and anomalous look of how, how those things are working. And, and, and if something is compromised, can we rely on our current investment of our infrastructure to quarantine those devices? And do I have the team or the, the expertise of staff to revoke that network access and to, to fix those things? And when we look at that, can we change access on the fly, manually, or automated? So when we're looking at tools that collect NetFlow or collect behavior anomalous detection from your current infrastructure, do I have the capability of reacting to it quickly? Do I have that button that says quarantine this user because I determined this bad? Do I have the investment in, in, in that fabric that's making that changes in your infrastructure and the analytics, the assurance, that's going to make those changes within the infrastructure with a set policy rule set that's going to do that for you. And that goes back again to when we discover those IoT devices, we're profiling them, right? And if we need to enforce trust-based access, are the user's devices, are we segmenting, segmentating those devices? And if so, do I have an automated vulnerability assessment of those devices? Is it automated for me? Not just once a week or once a month to meet compliance, but do I have it done in real time when a device is accessing my network and I get a report off it? And is, is my network doing something to quarantine or block those devices if they fail those vulnerabilities? 
And when we look at that visibility down to medical devices or industrial devices, we need to make sure that we're looking at use cases that of a, of a NAC solution, network access control, that is identifying the devices that are important to us, being medical devices, being uh, industrial devices, Siemens or Philips or, or, what, or, or, or Fluke or whatever that's out there that they're utilizing, and that you're not having to spend endless hours trying to create profiles or create postures, that you have a solution that's identifying those for you and works and has a, a functional feed that feeds updated information into that solution so that you're, you're well protected. Because when we walked into that medical area and that healthcare area, like I said before, there's an inherited trust that you have with a doctor because you assume they're smarter than you and that you assume they're going to tell you something you don't know. But in a lot of ways, a doctor really works a lot like a security engineer. They ask questions. They want to know everything from A to Z to identify what's going on and be able to identify what they need to fix. So, for example, when you go into a network and they have a hot spot, you know, there's different ways to do it. We go about it. There's, you know, you just get instant access. Uh, you could register yourself or you could be sponsored. You know, when I used to go to concerts, uh, there was always a hot spot. But the, what I had to do was maybe authenticate via my Facebook or my Instagram. Uh, sometimes when I went to a school, it asked me for my email in order for me to get access. And a lot of times, if you ever go to a Cisco office or some corporate office, the lobby ambassador has to give you a login in order to have that guest access within that environment. But if I'm doing that and I'm on a network that's not trusted, is there an encryption? Is there, uh, and what am I doing to validate that it's me on this guest network accessing that application? Because again, I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself on this network and, and, and what this network stands for. There could be someone next to me doing something bad. Great example, I was in Southwest Airlines before this whole pandemic. I launched uh, you know, a pair OS on my laptop and I, I got curious. I wanted to see if I could crash the AP and the, and the Southwest Airlines. I was, but I was doing something bad. The person next to me, um, when I developed my reverse proxy man in the middle in that Southwest Airlines, I was able to verify everything they were doing, and they were protected. They used a, a two-factor authentication. They were VPN. They were encrypted. They did all the things they could do to not follow the proxy that I, I set up at the man in the middle to quarantine them as an agent or whatever it might be down to their level to make sure that I was not intercepting their data. And there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle as far as how it happens. So when you look at SD access as far as integration, we need to make sure when you when you look at that onion that it's not hollow in the middle, that you have devices out there that are, are that are, could be API integrated into an overall solution. And when I talk about ICE uh, or DNA Center for an example, uh, that it can integrate with those via API with Meraki or Stealthwatch or whatever third party solution you might have out there. At this point, I care more about you as the customer protecting your environment than doing stuff plugs and saying buy Cisco. Because it is important, especially in this pandemic and the rise of threats and issues, and it's just getting worse, that we do everything in our power to take a new look of how to protect us in these environments. And, and I would be happy with that. If there's anything you took away from today's environment about zero trust, this is that are we evaluating the correct needs? Oh, do we have the correct firewall? Are we using the correct SD access? Are we using the correct analytical tools and if it is Cisco, I'd be very happy and grateful, but I, I care more about that you're protecting yourself. And to talk about that center plane of glass on how we look at this, we have a solution called DNA Center. And DNA Center allows us to inherit the zero trust framework and use that as a fabric manager down to your switch, your routers, your endpoint, and, and using ICE as an example to, to, to be able to enforce security at a network level and be able to create those contracts that we talked about between different roles or different quarantine and tagging between an environment. And there is some, some foundation that needs to be configured from a firewall perspective, but we are learning DNA Center has the capability to not only deploy, but has analytics, profiling, and, and aggregation. So we can do fingerprints on from an endpoint perspective. We can look at uh, probes and how things get, gain access to a network, uh, easy onboarding tools when it comes to wireless or devices, right? Uh, fingerprinting, um, you know, database connectors, visibility tools, and it's more of a security fabric. 
and, and a pivotal point for Cisco security to bring in third parties or as well as our own products like Stealthwatch or ICE or um, Firewatch, Firepower, Meraki, and, and use that class and pain to be able to identify what they are. And when you look at that, it is important when you look at zero trust that you do integrate multiple avenues of that. And it could be your firewall, could be your VPN connections, be your SD-WAN or a web security appliance, because there is not a single one all product that will do it all. And, and, and if there's anything that I always teach in, in a, 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 you know, a vendor neutral perspective when I talk about SANS or I talk about um, you know, hacking cons or whatever, is that you, you must look from a high overview. Like for example, if I were to spill a coffee, I don't start a sniffer or I don't start cleaning the coffee from the edge of the room. I, I usually go and analyze where I spilled the coffee and focus on that area. And, and that's the same approach I'm asking you guys to take is take a high overview look of your posture and identify what, else, what product solutions, whatever it might be, analysis, to be able to enforce that security in that coffee stain and to fix it and be able to use if it's a proxy server or a firewall or any connect. But the most important thing about zero trust to wrap up this conversation is to take advantage of data boxes services such as assessment. It always starts with visibility, a posture check, looking at how you're set up today identifying what your workloads are, identifying your workflows, identifying the devices that you have, doing those assessments and making sure that you have a diagram that shows what those gaps are. And I'm proud to say that Databox, for example, uses our safe architecture that they can use to determining on your use case, if you're in the industry of, of hospitality, healthcare, energy, or whatever it might be, that they will take a step-by-step -step analysis of your workflow and identifying the gaps of security that you have within your environment, and then be able to figure out what zero trust model you need to enforce in, in to, by the gaps they've identified, either being product or solutions or advisory consultation, to be able to enforce that. And that's really where why I'm proud of the zero trust model, because it could be malware, it could be ransomware, it could be identified invisibility. It, it has an answer to being able to say, you must earn my trust before you gain access, either being by role, device, posture, whatever it might be. So in this journey, I do ask you to join me on it. And I've been very happy if you've been on my previous calls uh, with workplace uh, and workforce, my next one will be on workload. And we'll kind of focus a little bit more on application visibility workflows and what we do to look at anomalous behavior. But it, it really has been a, a great honor to hold these webinars, and, and I'm real big in just education, and I believe freedom of education. I mean, that is your right to know the education of what's out there, how to enforce it, and, and how and what we can do to make these policies and these frameworks, you know, more enticing for you guys to implement these in your environments. Because I do care about the trust and and the um, threats that you might have in your environment. What we could do to remediate those. So with that being said, thank you uh, for your time. I hope that you guys take the time to join us on our uh, on Databox upcoming webinar. I have one more with you guys called the workload. So with that being said, Paul, I'll hand it back over to you. And if there's any questions, feel free to ask. All right, thank you, Aaron, for um, an informative session again. Uh, so we do actually have a few questions over here. Um, so um, Aaron, uh, Daniel, and Chris, if you don't mind. Uh, so uh, the first question is, um, does every endpoint require an agent to meet zero trust workplace model? So de depending on what, which category we're looking at on the zero trust model, the answer, unfortunately, is a yes and no, right? Um, so the function to get is that there are ways that to do what I call agentless posturing. Uh, ICE, Cisco ICE gives you, from a NAC perspective, gives you the capability of identifying uh, endpoints and identifying um, the posture associated to that particular per, uh, that particular device and, and be able to set policies on them. Of course, there is an agent version. Um, obviously, in that agent version, uh, it allows us to have that little bit deeper look into what software versions or what uh, vulnerabilities they have. 
um, and, and how they're being accessed or if the registry is being changed on that particular device. And, and a lot of that, that, that might be any connect uh, for Cisco to be able to identify that. So the combination of agent list and agent is really helpful from a NAC perspective to just dig deeper. So to answer your question, no, not everything needs an agent, um, but there is an agent version of it that allows us to get dig a lot deeper into those devices. But there are also devices out there that, that can't take agents, right? Um, let's say, for example, like a handheld or um, let's say like an iPad, or not an iPad, like a handheld scanner gun for like the airport, right? Uh, may not be able to put a, an agent in it. So there is an agentless way to posture those type of devices. I hope that answers your question. Okay. So um, the second question is, uh, does zero trust model require a NAC solution? So yes. So in the workplace area, Obviously, that's one pillar of the zero trust model, and and, and a NAC solution. And forgive me if I use uh, acronyms. A, a network, a, a, a NAC is a network access control solution, and you know not just Cisco has this. There's many different vendors that have, have one. There's there's open source. There's paid. There's supported versions. You know, um, but the one that we have here at Cisco is called ICE. Cisco ICE Identity Service Engine, and basically what it does is it, it it allows us to profile and posture devices visibility of those devices and set actions on them. Meaning if you don't meet a certain level of criteria, do you need access to my network or should I quarantine you or whatever, right? Uh, it also from a wireless perspective allows you to create captive portals and authentication, right? Are you authenticated? And if so, we'll do what we call change of authority down at a port or a wireless level to, to make sure they're a part of the correct VLAN from a segmentation point of view. So to answer that question, uh, yes, uh, you know, there are other pillars of the zero trust model uh, for like applications and you need visibility from self watch retentration. But for workplace, uh, you do need that API, that NAT solution to do integrations and to do that mitigation. Yes. Okay. So I think um, you kind of sort of answered uh, the third question that we have over here. But um, the third question really is, does, does Zero Trust Workplace enable network segmentation beyond traditional VLAN capability. Yes, so uh, I, I think I lightly went over that um, just a second ago, but I'll, I'll go into it a little bit further. And I'm really, that's actually a really good question. And the reason why is because segmentation in all three pillars of the workforce is, is so important. Um, and, I, and, and earlier, I went over the example of ACI, just from that perspective, application control, I'm sorry, application-centric infrastructure, where, you know, let's say you and I, Paul, are in the same room, and unfortunately, if I had COVID and I sneeze, those droplets uh, can kind of in, in, kind of go in that, in, in that little area, and you could probably get sick, right? So what we would do in, in, is build a bubble, right? And in that bubble, we could probably use like a, a PVC pipe or, or a straw between our bubble and just exchange information that we're allowed to. It could be like a no or be like that. But the likeliness of me being infected is less or you being infected is less because I'm not sneezing on you, right? Uh, so segmentation is so important because the more EPGs, endpoint groups, or the more VLANs, beyond VLANs or VX VLANs or um, endpoint groups or, or, or quarantine, whatever it might be, is such an important thing because a lot of times people think, hey, I created a VLAN. Is that good enough for segmentation? It, it isn't. Um, and that's why we came up with SGTs, where now SGTs allows us to determine change of authority on a port and say, okay, I'm part of this tag. And as I go through this infrastructure, this tag says, I have these firewall rules, these VLANs, this infrastructure, this access. So there's a lot of dynamic changes on the back end. So, and I'm really happy to say that Cisco, from a trust tech perspective, has that dynamic um, adoption based on ICE and based on your NAC to make those changes automatically for you on the back end. So, no, VLANs are not just, hey, I'm doing segmentation. It's a great start, but there's a, a much, much more to it. That concludes our session for today. Thank you so much, Aaron and the Cisco team um, for your time and a great presentation. And thank you all for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye.